I am going to lay out, <clears throat> I'm just warning you here, a challenging argument for you this evening. And I hope you're going to find real, uh, really encouragement and, and inspiration in what I'm about to tell you. Seriously, we recognize that many of you have grown discouraged, really discouraged as this decade has unfolded, and not for no reason. I think many people are discouraged about rising social disorder, like drug epidemics, racial unrest, unlike anything we've seen in a while. I don't know if you realize, murders were up in this country nation nationwide 11% last year. Uh, we know that important groups of Americans are lagging economically, and social fractures seem to be popping up everywhere. And I think people are discouraged about the prospect that government or politics is going to be able to fix any of these things anytime soon. You know, this is not irrational that what you see on the screen here uh, is taking place. That, that for about 10 years, by the way, this has been the case. For about 10 years, roughly 7 out of 10 Americans have felt like our country's on the wrong track. And the reality is it could be many years, folks, many years before we feel good again about our public sector institutions. I think that's just a reality. But however dismayed uh, they are about our governance, you know, patriotic Americans have made crystal clear that they, they don't want to pull back into their shells. They don't want to give up on strengthening and refining our society. So we at the Roundtable have been asking ourselves, we've been saying, is there some roadmap we can offer? Is there, is there something we can do to help public-spirited philanthropists who want to carry out useful culture reforms, even if the government re remains a, you know, a huge frozen tundra? Can we help them do that? And the answer, my friends, is yes, we can. I'm going to start you out here by painting a little picture. So let me read you a few sentences, if I could, and see if any of this rings true with you. Demagogues and pundits have abandoned serious discussion of principles and stooped to slanders, falsehood, trickery, and scalping and roasting alive of opponents. These cheap tricks have aroused low passions among the public, and wild, blind partisanship is overtaking reason and individual judgment. Scholars say that no era was more politically fractured or obsessed with ideology. Many Americans are shocked by the, um, the coarseness of public discourse, and substance abuse is on the rise, particularly among the working class, which is thought to be under stress, serious stress due to national economic dislocations. Uh, racial antagonism uh, has resulted in violence and street clashes in places ranging from you know, Ohio to New York to Missouri, plunging some cities into what observers are calling mobocracy. Now, I'm afraid that probably all that sounds very familiar, right? Well, what you have just heard, every word of you, what you've just heard is taken from mournful, first-hand descriptions of our country in the, uh, the first half of the 19th century. Many Americans then felt that something was going really profoundly wrong with our country. Um, one very impressive young attorney warned a Midwestern audience in 1838 that there is something of ill omen among us. I mean the increasing disregard of law which pervades the country, the growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lieu of sober judgment. And that young lawyer was named Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Welcome to Jacksonian America. Votes were openly traded at that point for booze and jobs and favors, um, turning elections into circuses. This is a picture of an election in, in Philadelphia about that era. A, a, a really big tussle, I want you to know, in the, in the election of 1828 when Jackson won office was, who was more shameful, Mrs. Jackson or Mrs. Adams? That was a, that was a big issue in that election. So uh, there was a new party system, a brand new party system that, that um, included the idea that the winners of elections were basically earned the right to stuff the government with their cronies, and sometimes to stuff their pockets with silver. Uh, from the national capital to Tammany Hall, this was an era of fraud and embezzlement and self-enrichment at the public trough. Uh, at Jackson's inauguration, I've been reading some just hilarious but kind of tragic things about the inauguration. At the inauguration, there were a whole bunch of people who observed that they were shocked how many men had bloody noses at the inauguration from all the fist fighting which got me thinking, I wonder if that's where the, the tradition of the red tie comes from in politics, you know? That's, just guessing here, I don't know that for a fact, but this is a picture from the White House Historical Association of the reception at the White House after Jackson's inauguration. The crowd literally broke most of the glassware and the chinaware in the White House, pawing their way to the whiskey punch and the cake. And 
the White House stewards got so alarmed at one point that they actually decided they had to bring tubs of, of whiskey punch out onto the front lawn to lure people out of the mansion. <laughs> um, keep that tip in mind if you have an inaugural party this year, by the way. <laughs> Ethnicity and social class were really sore points in the 19th century. Millions of new immigrants were flooding into the country and they were bringing all kinds of patterns of religious practice and family structure and work and alcohol consumption and home life that were, that were unfamiliar and often very unwelcome. Uh, Americans, get this folks, Americans of that era guzzled three to four times as much alcohol per capita as we do today. All right? These are the amazing statistics you can see for yourself. Uh, I don't even have to tell you what that led to, okay? Let, just let your imagination run wild. Violent, um, this is probably partly related, but violent pastimes were a big deal. This is actually an image from a very famous, they called it a sporting hall in New York City, um, where was, uh, basically gamblers came to, to bet on just crazy violent activities. This was one of the favorites. This was, you match a terrier against 100 starved rats. This was a big deal. Uh, and all kinds of things were taking place every day in cities like New York. Among men, uh, there was a, a real problem with a street fighting style called gouging. You can look this up if you want. And guys would actually grow their fingernails long so they could pop the eyeball out of another person's house. And there were other people who were filing their teeth so they could bite off appendages. I mean, folks, if you think we are the first Americans to face culture problems or political <laughs> problems, think again. Um, these were, and we've been in worse places in times past, much worse places. And then as now, I am here to tell you, government entities were not very effective at turning any of this around. So I realize you're saying to yourself, great, this is a perfect after dinner speech. You know, um, thanks for cheering me up, Carl. Please pass the dessert. But um, there is an exciting other half of this history, okay? And I want to take you on a little tour here. Americans who were dismayed by this ugliness, and it was really ugly, um, there were lots of them. And uh, people like Char Charles Finney or um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who knew she was so beautiful, huh? Or, or William Jay, this is the son of John Jay, one of the founders. Um, these kinds of people didn't just retreat, all right? They didn't just escape. They didn't run away to private life. They took action. They realized, though, they were very savvy people, and they realized that the problems afflicting Jacksonian America were not the kinds of things that elections and policy changes can do much to cure. So they and lots of other leaders fought back against, you know, cultural crudity, against, um, you know, against dirty politics, but they fought back via philanthropy and civic action. Among those who led us toward national recovery through phil philanthropic action, I personally would place these two men at the front of the line. These are the brothers Lewis and Arthur Tappan. And I have to confess, I am in the midst of a major bromance with these two guys. <laughs> these, these were, I mean, you can f forget about Wilbur and Orville, right? Forget about the Kennedys, forget about the Koch brothers. These, these two individuals did more to shape America than any brothers in, 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 in our history, in my opinion. Lewis and Arthur were successful entrepreneurs. They uh, operated just off of Wall Street in lower Manhattan. And they were devout evangelical Christians. And they were the most potent donors for culture change, perhaps ever to operate in America. Uh, through heavy giving and uh, really brilliant organizing, they and many allies built up a huge number of, of uh, charitable organizations that worked on everything from that alcohol problem I showed you to teaching street children to, to read to turning public opinion against slavery. Um, the Tappan family were uh, from New England. They grew up in our Puritan tradition, very much in our Puritan tradition. And I thought you might be amused by a little glimpse of the strong internal constraints that were nurtured within Americans of their background. So let me read you, these are actual motherly instructions that I found that were mailed to Lewis's uh, future wife when she visited a, uh, a friend in the nearby city. The mother's first bit of written counsel to her daughter was be cautious of speaking about any person. And you know, that's, that's good, that's just good wholesome Christian advice. That's basically saying don't, don't gossip, avoid gossiping. So we can, we can go there. Her second urging was put your trust where it can never be disappointed. Now, for those of you who didn't have evangelical mothers, this is code, all right? <laughs> Trust me. Next came, don't go out in the evening. That is blatant code. <laughs> and, 
and that was followed by keep near your friend Miss Smith. More strong code. This is really getting strong. And then mom closes the letter with, write me immediately if you've been dancing. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And this, of course, is foundational dogma for both the Methodist and Baptist churches. So this really went a long ways. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I, we all know that it's easier to improve the ethical tone in a nation when there's a religious revival taking place. And the reformers of the Jacksonian era both helped kick up and then rode a huge wave of, uh, of religious feeling. Historians call this our second great awakening. Here you can see a Methodist camp gathering, which is a very common kind of uh, meeting of, of that era where people would come together for preaching and teaching and personal exhortations. Our first great awakening, I, I, I bet many of you know, was about a half century earlier and was very important, one of the major causes really of the American Revolution. And the second uh, awakening during the 19th century, in my opinion, was even more important. It kicked off its own kind of a revolution, a moral and social revolution in this country that was tremendously important in making us the nation we are today. To improve society and to improve personal behavior, the reformers of the day created this vast array of effective programs. And you, you know, this is a hundred and some years ago. You have to kind of look beneath the fussy, ornate titles of some of these groups. But I just want to kind of give you a little sense of the breathtaking ambition of these charities. Groups were set up to improve schools, to aid the poor, to um, temper alcohol consumption, and distribute the Bible, to help those who are in prison, and to propagate Sunday schools to assist orphans and elderly sailors and poor people overseas and slaves. There were literally thousands of, of, of groups like these. And public-spirited citizens not only gave money to groups like these and, and, and raised money from their friends, but also, more importantly, they volunteered their time and their labor in large quantities. Um, this is an image of a family visiting a poor neighborhood to offer Bibles and food and clothing. One really important sociological benefit of this was that it got millions of middle-class businessmen and housewives and students in direct personal contact with the poor and with slaves and with drunkards and with lonely sailors and with abandoned you know, widows and disenfranchised minorities. And they, they developed real understanding, you know, absolute first-person expertise in what was going on in our tenements, and what was going on in our slave quarters, what was going on in our docks. These people knew because they had direct contact, and it made them very, very sa savvy helpers. Historians note that 19th century reformers didn't, um, didn't, quote, possess extraordinary vision or wisdom. They merely experimented with various solutions to the problems that they saw, and then focused their energies on those that seemed to work best. One hugely influential creation, innovation, I'd say, of these philanthropists was their creation of Sunday schools. And you thought your mama invented that. Nope, that was philanthropy. You have to remember, through much of the 19th century, fully half of our kids, all right, half of American children did not attend formal schooling. And the reason is they were out working. And like these news girls, or even more by a lot of farm kids, they, they went to work early on. And they did not get um, reading, writing, or arithmetic when they're trudging off to a job six days a week. So a, a large group of volunteers and donors Believing that in a democratic republic where everyone has an equal voice, that's a problem not to have an, a, a uniformly educated electorate, went to work to compensate for that. And their calculus was that, um, you know, everybody has, just about everybody has one free day a week, and that's Sunday. And so how about if we start giving uh, literacy lessons on, and much more, on Sundays? And the first Sunday schools taught kids to, um, they taught them the alphabet in the beginning, and then they taught them how to read and write. The Bible was used as a main text, so in the process there was a tremendous amount of religious knowledge transmitted while the kids were getting the tools of communication. And children were taught all kinds of other valuable skills in the process. Memorization was a big emphasis. Public speaking was, 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 was really imparted. And obviously, there was extensive um, moral instruction and character training taking place in these Sunday schools. These schools tapped into really deep hungers in the population, and they were wildly popular. Um, many children picked up more of their literacy, not to mention their moral compass, in these Sunday schools than they did in our very inadequate public schools. Um, 
have a quote here, as an agency of cultural transmission, this is the, the leading historian on the topic, as an agency of cultural transmission, the charitable Sunday school rivaled in importance the 19th century public school, even though they met obviously for much fewer hours per week. The founders of Sunday schools were especially concerned about poor kids and, uh, and you know, immigrant kids, working class children, blacks and Native Americans, newly um, uh, arrived people. And so they began their efforts there. You're looking here at a Sunday school that operated in Oklahoma for Comanche Indians. But uh, very soon, middle class children started flocking into these classrooms as well. And it wasn't long after that, that adult Sunday schools became a big deal. A, a lot of uh, day laborers, you know, manual workers, um, wanted to get instruction outside of, of working hours and started to do that in Sunday schools. And thanks to very energetic support from donors and volunteers, the growth of Sunday schools was meteoric, as you can see here. Uh, I, I, and, you know, this was tremendously important. A, a very broad culture of reading grew out of this in our country. And this was a, historians say this is one of the main reasons that American workers were the most literate in the world by the end of the, of the 19th century. And just as important as these, as the literacy skills, Sunday schools transmitted this whole complex of Protestant virtues and personal disciplines and, uh, and moral perspectives that equipped poor children to very quickly move into the middle class, into the, the burgeoning middle class. The Sunday school movement's most posted, potent uh, asset, in my opinion, really secret weapon, was these teachers. Um, most of the teachers were enthusiastic young adults, completely volunteer. Um, many of them were coming out of the Second Great Awakening and really inspired to, to try to, to, to help other people in some way. A lot of them were only you know, 10 or 15 years at most older than the kids they were teaching. And very quickly, many of them became not just instructors, but mentors and role models for these kids. And there's a very touching literature out there of really personal stories about how the, the relationships that developed between these, these young adults and the children that they, were, that they were working with. You can think of them as, I think of them as kind of the Teach for America volunteers of their era. There were some really high quality uh, individuals who poured themselves into this work. Uh, another fascinating part of this was Sunday schools built up really amazing lending libraries. All right? By 1832, there were about 4,000 Sunday schools in this country that had libraries that children could, could take books home from, uh, and the average collection had about 100 books. And then the libraries became much commoner and much larger as time went on. Um, and these libraries were very important in helping prepare children for life in a country where reading was really becoming quickly essential to success. And this was a time, I want you to remember, this was a time when a lot of people looked askance at fiction. Fiction was considered to be somewhere between useless and possibly even harmful. And that was not the view of the Sunday School movement after a while. They, a whole, they, they created a whole new genre of Christian fiction for children. Um, and with funding from uh, philanthropists, began to produce and write and distribute these books through Sunday schools. And the movement leaders were wise enough to understand that when you get into a child's head with a story, you are not only you know, stretching their brain with printed words, you, you are also opening opportunities to inform their appetites and their values. So this very interesting uh, literature grew up. And in general, this was extremely savvy culture change. The most consequential social reform of all in America, I mean, to this day, is, of course, the abolition of slavery. That was powered by philanthropists, folks, completely. Um, and listen. This is an important thing for us all to remember. Culture change is not for cowards, all right? It, and this is a very good place to illustrate it. Certainly, the donors and the volunteers who became involved in abolition needed courage to match their convictions because from the very first moment they stuck their heads up, they started to get bullied and mocked and attacked. As part of their benevolent efforts, um, Arthur and Lewis Tappan, the, the brothers I introduced you to before, they bought this, this old rundown circus hall, believe it or not. This is a circus hall in lower Manhattan, and they bought it to convert it into a church. And um, what they called the Chatham Street Chapel um, was made available. They opened it up to, to New Yorkers of all races to go there and worship, or you could go there for public discussions, you could go there for, for charitable meetings, for concerts. Um, you know, so far as I know, there were no trapeze acts, but pretty much anything short of that, you were allowed to use this building. And it, be just, it, it became a hive, it became a hive of charitable activity. And it was in this building that the Tappan brothers in 1833 organized the New York Anti-Slavery Society, which was the first of its kind. That new charity was exactly two years old when a riot broke out. 
uh, it was um, when they heard that, that an anti-slavery association was being created, a, a group of opponents uh, gathered a crowd for a counter meeting. They literally put up handbills on Tammany Hall and stuff, and pretty quickly a b bunch of people gathered. And it wasn't long before it turned violent. They, they, they stormed over to the, to the church, trashed the church, and, and scattered the, the Tappans and, and other uh, donors to the cause at knife point. The Tappans, however, were not cowed. Right? They were not spooked by this. Immediately after, Arthur, um, Arthur provided the grants that set up similar anti-slavery societies in other states. And then he and Lewis organized the very first national convention of abolitionists. Um, and then on a hot July 4th, uh, exactly seven months after the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed, the national version, additional attacks took place in New York City. Uh, as part of this, a well-dressed man on a horse led a crowd of several thousand people right to Lewis Tappan's house, which was on, Low, on, on Rose Street in Lower Manhattan. And Lewis had been warned in advance, and he and his family fled. But this massive rabble pulled down poles and things, battered in his front door, invaded the house, dragged all of the family possessions out into the street and burned them. The next day, the marauders were back out again. They were smashing offices and uh, publications and churches and homes, anything associated with the abolitionist charities. Right? It was, that, was, that was the target. They roared up to the three-story warehouse and store that the Tappan brothers ran as their business, too. I mean, it, Business intimidation is an old game, all right? They, this crowd surrounded the building. It was a big old granite structure. Luckily, it had heavy iron shutters on the windows. And most of all, Arthur holed up inside with his clerks and his friends, and, and he handed out 36 muskets, which tends to discourage property invasions. <laughs> so that building was not burned down. But um, it was a mess. Uh, here you can see a map here of Lower Manhattan. Uh, <clears throat> All of these stars are among the dozens of homes and businesses and churches that were attacked. The one labeled number one, that's the Chatham Street Chapel. Number two, that's Lewis's house. And three, that's the Tappan Brothers' business. It got so bad that um, they had to call out troops. And New York City went under martial law after this riot. This became national news. All right? This was a big deal. And Lewis, who had really special gifts for understanding public opinion, he decided he was going to leave his house exactly as it was when the attackers left to stand as, quote, a silent anti-slavery preacher to the crowds who will flock to see it. He knew this was going to be a phenomenon. And you know, this is his, his children's like, clothing was out in the street and the family heirlooms. I mean, you can, this was painful, I'm quite sure, but these were brave people, as I tried to tell you earlier. So very soon after this riot, the two brothers decide, and a lot of allies, a lot of philanthropic allies, decided they were going to fight back. But they were going to fight back with words, not with battering rams and stones. So they devised a, a plan, a charitable plan, to flood the U.S. with anti-slavery mailings. Okay? They started with $30,000 of personal donations, and they first founded a whole group of publications that would make this argument. So they, they set up several high-circulation newspapers. This is a children's magazine that they founded. They had a, uh, an illustrated monthly. They had a philosophical journal, kind of a whole range of kind of persuasive documents. And they started churning these out in volume on brand new steam-powered presses, which was a new technology at the time. And then they um, staged them at New York City post offices so they could be hurried all across the country. And the abolitionists called this their effort in moral suasion. Right? That was their term for it. I, I found in the National Postal Museum uh, a description of it as America's first ever direct mail campaign. <laughs> and I, I never thought about that, but I mean, this, apparently that's what it was. I mean, this is the first time anybody ever tried this. It certainly was one of the, the most ambitious polemical blitzes of any sort ever tried in this country. And, and they, they, they mailed these, these mailings out to, the main targets were um, businessmen and ministers and judges and local legislators living all across the country, including in the South. And over a period of 10 months, the American Anti-Slavery Society, with these donations they collected, mailed out more than a million pieces of anti-slavery literature. This was a big blitz. And it made the apologists for slavery absolutely crazy. The moral suasion campaign sparked this huge backlash. Um, anti-slavery ma mailings began to be pulled out of post offices. They were breaking into post offices to find the mailbags and pulling them out and burning them in public squares. President Andrew Jackson actively encouraged this. He actively asked his postmaster general and, and all postmasters to suppress these mailings and, and asked them to look the other way so vigilantes could, like these guys, if, if they weren't willing or able to. 
The president also called for a national censorship law that would shut down charitable mailings, all right? All mailings of writings that he called incendiary. This struggle was really crucial in turning the hearts and minds of many Americans against slavery. So we're talking about suppression of speech and attacks on homes and churches, many, many acts of thuggish violence. This pushed public opinion in the direction of abolition in a big way. The rioters and the mail burners who were hoping that they were going to shut down the, um, the American Anti-Slavery Society and intimidate its charitable backers, that was their direct motive, instead had exactly the opposite effect. In the year after Lewis Tappan's home was trashed, in the year after that, 15,000 Americans bought new subscriptions to the AASS publications. Anti-slavery societies began to spread like wildfire all across the country. You can see there were 200 chapters in 1835. That was one year after Tappan's house got burned. Uh, another year after that, it was up to 527. Two years later, it's up to 1,400 chapters around the country. You've know, got to remember, folks, this is an era of very difficult communications. By the end of this, this time period, uh, the American Anti-Slavery Society had enrolled 250,000 paying members. That was 2% of the total population of the country. I did the math to put it in contemporary terms. That's bigger than today's Chamber of Commerce. That's bigger than the NRA today. That's bigger than, than the Boy Scouts today. This was a huge mobilization and a tremendous accomplishment uh, by philanthropists. And it was, it was philanthropists who turned abolition into a major popular crusade for the very first time. And with absolutely no help from the government, mind you, and lots of obstruction, in fact. And the result was that slavery was very suddenly a subject that no American could ignore. Now, a final piece of the charitable crusade to end slavery was a marshalling of legal defense efforts. Right? So in all kinds of courtrooms, there were, you know, there were attempts to establish precedents in law. There were uh, defenses, various defenses launched of pioneer activists and helpful journalists. And criminal trials were used to educate Americans on the realities of slavery. Uh, the most dramatic courtroom case unfolded in uh, 1839. Several dozen Africans who had been kidnapped by, slaveries, by slavers excuse me, managed to take over the ship that was holding them and transporting them, which was called the Amistad. And the, during the uprising, the captain was killed, and the crew members were ordered by the former captives to sail them back to their home in Africa. But the navigator tricked them and landed the ship in Long Island instead. And when it landed, the Africans were taken into custody, custody and charged with murder. The Tappans got wind of this, and they jumped on it. And they, um, they first engaged a really first-rate legal team. And then they launched an extremely savvy journalistic and public relations effort that turned the trial into a teachable moment. That's what they immediately understood this could be. This mural depicts the trial. Um, that's Arthur Tappan in the front row. Uh, sitting with the defendants, with one of the defense lawyers whispering in his ear. Um, it took two years for this trial to wind its way through the courts, and Americans were glued to, to the Daily Report. This is the OJ trial of its day. And um, thanks entirely, I mean completely, to the effort and support of these donors, the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately ruled that the Africans were kidnapped victims and had a right to defend themselves, and they were released. That very high-profile uh, struggle left many Americans just disgusted with the day-to-day -day realities of human bondage. And after the trial, thousands more people started donating money to anti-slavery anti uh, charities and subscribing to their journals. And the, you know, really the most consequential social change in the history of the United States had begun, and philanthropy was right at the heart of it. A final triumph in, uh, in changing culture through philanthropy, which is what I'm talking about here, was the temperance movement. And um, local groups and mutual aid programs powered by charity dramatically reduced consumption of alcohol in this country. And more importantly, really transformed American social life in general. Now I realize when I say this, or you could even get that old fashioned word up there on the screen, everyone thinks, well, prohibition, wasn't that like one of the great flops of all time? You know, kind of this huge puritanical failure is, the, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the, the conventional wisdom. But the national government's very late in the game law enforcement flop actually obscures a much deeper success. Um, over decades of, 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 of powerful charitable organizing, huge numbers of Americans voluntarily stepped away from booze. Let me, let me just kind of trace the progress here for you. When, when the temperance movement got started, 
Americans drank, there's this great line, one writer put it, Americans drank from the crack of dawn to the crack of dawn. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there's no question that just a, an alcoholic haze hung over many of our communities. Um, in, Ma in Manhattan in 1890, Jacob Reese um, counted more than 4,000 liquor or beer shops just south of 14th Street in Manhattan, which is, of course, where all the, the poor immigrants were packed in. Um, plenty of propaganda and exploitation went into building up this level of drinking. Advertisements pushed the idea that, that booze was healthful and invigorating and great for calming children. You know, that's literally, you can see this is, this is I, don't, I don't know if you can see in the back, this is grandpa and granddaughter clinking glasses. And they're saying, Gesundheit, which was like cheers or salut, you know. And actually these ads are even more startling. The, the ad on the right has a slogan underneath the high chair that reads, the youngster, ruddy with good cheer, serenely sips his lager beer. And then the ad slogan underneath the, the, the nursing mother says, lager's amber fluid mild gives health and strength to wife and child. Um, I was kind of shocked when I saw this stuff, but this was happening. And, you know, the reality was much less pretty and funny. It was, there was huge rates of domestic violence, of damaged health, rampant work, worker absenteeism. I mean, there's all kinds of amazing stories about people who just didn't show up at factories. A lot of factories had to close on Mondays because they had so many hungover workers. It, it, it was a major national problem. Family turmoil, you can imagine. And stepping up to battle this problem was, there was this whole panoply of, uh, of charitable organizations. As early as 1833, there were more than 700 separate temperance societies just in New York State, our biggest state. And at that point, I, I figured out 12 out of every 100 New York residents had signed a pledge of voluntary abstinence from alcohol. And the lost trade from that voluntary campaign caused 133 out of the 292 distilleries in the state to shut down. Again, this wasn't laws, this wasn't enforcement, this was persuasion. Um, for many decades, before it turned into a, a constitutional amendment, the, the, the anti-alcohol alcohol campaign was completely built on persuasion. It was a big multimedia effort. There were, I mean, there were millions of published words. The most popular public speakers of the day were involved. Um, there were prominent blue ribbon commissions. There was all kinds of instructional material created for schools. Um, there was popular entertainment. There was recognition of the fact that you know, a lot of people ended up in taverns just out of love of company. They didn't really go in for the alcohol necessarily. They, they went in for the, for the social life. And again, recognizing this in a savvy way, some of the charitable leaders promoted alternative social life. So they started setting up temperance balls and temperance fairs and temperance parades and temperance societies. And um, singing actually became a big part of gatherings. Many original songs were written for temperance and temperance glee singers made merry with ditties like close up the booze shop. There was this, as I said, this whole kind of effort to kind of make peace with, the, with popular entertainment. Um, now the campaign against abuse of, of uh, alcohol involved one of the, really I think maybe the widest coalition ever assembled for social change in this country. Really when you read the, 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 the role, it's quite interesting. They were unionists and they were manufacturers. They were you know, avowed conservatives and they were progressives. They were rural pastors and they were urban activists and they were very rich and very poor. This is one of the only places in the country where you could sit Orville Wright down next to you know, Booker T. Washington, next to Susan B. Anthony, next to Billy Sunday. These folks had absolutely nothing in common other than that they joined together on this important topic. And there were charitable groups working to change conditions at all levels. There, there, there were groups working nationally, there were groups working at the state and county level. Uh, I already mentioned there were big efforts to get individuals to sign personal pledges. And all of this civil organizing eventually made a huge difference. Alcohol consumption tumbled to just 30% of the levels that prevailed before the 10 percent activists went to work. And temperance did more than just reduce drinking. It had a really profound influence on American values. It, it, it strengthened our attachment not only to you know, sobriety, obviously, but also to frugality and to work and to whole new ideas of middle class respectability and what it meant to be kind of someone who could be counted on. And the, the whole ethic of constant self-improvement really grew up, a lot of that grew out of the temperance movement. And that's a big part of American knowledge. We have self-improvement books, we have crusades, we have you know, self-improvement groups. A lot of that started with temperance, this notion that you can remake yourself, you can refashion yourself. With help and solidarity from other people, you can do hard things. So as you've seen, 
when American society in earlier eras badly, badly, badly needed reform that our political system was unable to deliver, philanthropists fueled culture changes to, uh, through civil action. So, you know, the obvious $64,000 question today is, could those successes be repeated in our present era? I think that's what any sensible person has to ask themselves. And the fact is, they are already being repeated. In recent years, philanthropists have stepped into all kinds of breaches in performance by public agencies and offered vital repairs through private action. I'm going to just walk you through a few. It's philanthropy and civil society that led the way to the most important improvements in American schooling over the last generation. Everything from charter schools to Teach for America to all the best new STEM programs, uh, all kinds of fresh digital learning options, those grew out of philanthropy. Um, donors jumped obstacles to attack all kinds of neglected um, diseases and medical conditions, everything from autism to, to you know, uh, breast and prostate cancer and schizophrenia, Huntington's disease, Ebola, lots of diseases that, where the ball was being dropped by public agencies got picked up uh, by, by donors. Givers, I want to remind you, inaugurated the Green Revolution. They went after the tropical diseases that, again, were not being attacked. They invented and spread micro-lending. They promoted individual land ownership for peasants and shielded uh, developing world entrepreneurs from government stultification. These were the most effective actions of the last generation to reduce misery in poor countries, and they all grew out of philanthropy. Amidst gross underperformance um, by government job training programs, philanthropy today is pioneering some really effective ways to move the hardest to employ Americans into, uh, into the labor force. People like the homeless and released prisoners and disabled persons and re recovering addicts. Um, philanthropy is uh, reviving hundreds of ill-maintained urban parks today. I hope you all are aware of this. You know, it all started with Central Park in New York City, but then sp spread far, far beyond that. Um, and philanthropists are not only saving kind of decrepit parks, but are also creating all kinds of new parks. Again, this is a, this is a really exciting thing going on in places like Houston and Atlanta and Chicago. It's a massive park going up in Tulsa. I mean, Louisville, um, Memphis has got a neat thing going. Um, these are important places for urban people to refresh themselves. They were good places to get mugged when I was in college, but th th that's changing. And it's, again, all philanthropy. Um, philanthropy and civil society recently invented new approaches to chronic problems, things that we just were stuck on for decades, like backlogs in foster care and adoption. Just like no progress forever. And then all of a sudden, philanthropic kind of inventors got going and, and figured out new solutions. Drunk driving is another one. Uh, health relapses among elderly people who've just been released from hospitals is a fun little one that I, I got interested in. Addictions to smoking, drugs, and alcohol. These are places where philanthropy has been very, very helpful. At research universities, uh, donors, have been, donors have been essential to creating a lot, maybe most, of the new academic fields that didn't exist 20 years ago. Biomedical engineering was ferociously existed, resisted excuse me, by the bureaucracies on most college campuses. It was ramrodded through by, by basically some philanthropists. Computer-assisted learning, gerontology, a whole field that kind of got invented. Uh, systems biology, a lot of character and leadership education that's now becoming much commoner. Those were fields that, that, that uh, relied on, on oomph from donors uh, to really be born. Even when it comes to getting government's own house in order, I think Adam mentioned a little earlier, it's, it's, it's a remarkable fact that it has, it's, it's really philanthropists who sparked, who, who got the initial uh, momentum going for uh, public pension um, reforms in places like Rhode Island and Detroit and Utah, places like that. Um, so, okay, let's, um, I, think, I hope we can all acknowledge that America has done some huge belly flops when it comes to politics <laughs> in the last uh, decade or two. And when you belly flop, you have a couple options, you know? You can, you, can, you, can, you can lay down and think about how much your belly stings, all right? That's one option. You can fret about whether you're going to be paralyzed for life, you know, that's another option. Or you can shake it off and you can say, let's, let's try to grab some of the opportunities that are out there today to uh, make ourselves strong again. And the new book that we're giving you this evening um, provides more detail, but I want to just quickly run through some quick samples of areas where I think exciting culture fixes could be pretty quickly instituted or expanded by enlightened philanthropists today. For instance, I think the time is ripe for some philanthropic in invention to uh, attack problems like drug addiction, uh, like weak cybersecurity, 
like the explosion of, of children being raised by one parent. Um, you know, we desperately need fresh efforts today to assimilate immigrants, to build trust between police and minorities. Um, you know, what about reviving church participation? I, I speculate in the book about some ways we could do that through philanthropy. Drawing disabled people into the productive workforce. This is one of my hobby, hobby horses. There are Americans today who are working but in jobs that are going to disappear or at wages that don't support their families. We know how to help that. All right? We know how to get around that. Um, and philanthropic programs in those areas are the nation's very best. There are huge openings for guiding homeless individuals and released prisoners into, into useful lives. So even if, even if you take the gloomy case and you assume that government is going to be ineffective in years ahead, and you have to, prudently, you have to th say that's a very high risk, there are all kinds of ways. There are many, many, many improvements to American society that could still take place, that could be executed brilliantly by the organs of civil society. This, by the way, is a mosaic that I photographed out at, um, this is at Stanford Memorial Chapel on the campus of Stanford University. That was one of the earlier triumphs of philanthropy, folks. All right? This is the kind of thing that you think at the time, mm, is this going to lead to anything? Well, Leland Stanford's little baby turned into something pretty big for the whole world. I'd like to suggest that philanthropists should respond to political frustration by conducting a whole burst of micro experiments. All right? We need micro experiments in culture, in, um, in, in you know, family healing, in moral teachings, in economic incentives, in social organization, all kinds of areas. What we, what we really need is competing local laboratories. All right? We need real world tests. We need, we need I, I would like to see you all encourage kind of everything from regional alliances that are based on just geography to subcultures that are based on shared principles, whether they're religious or they're political or something. Just find people that agree with you and build things and test them and see which actually contribute to human flourishing and which do not. And if you try telling me that microgovernance of this type that I'm proposing is wishful thinking or that's pie in the sky, man, you're going to have an argument for me. Um, localized responses to human needs are what charitable entrepreneurs do all the time. All right, we spent a lot of time and energy building this book a couple years ago. This book has thousands, I mean thousands, of examples of philanthropic successes at fixing social ills. And I don't just mean putting flagpoles in the, in the town square. Big social ills that got fixed through philanthropy. And by the way, at an accelerating pace in recent years, it's gotten easier rather than harder. We have new tools now that we didn't have in the past. And for more evidence that I'm not just being a utopian idealist here and that this isn't pie in the sky, I want to, to point you in one other place. I want you to look at America's business sector. I think most of you realize the most powerful trend sweeping U.S. commerce today is decentralized, personalized services, okay? Folks, this, this is how the Marriott company now does hotels, for instance. This, this instead of one big company, that offers one standardized service, they now serve co uh, customers with more than 30 different smaller independent operations that provide varied choices depending on you know, where you are, what you need. And yeah, you can still stay at a Marriott if you want to, and that's what you need. But if you want to stay in a boutique place, you can go to a W or in a loft. If you want a luxury room, you can do Ritz Carlton or, or St. Regis, and they'll cater to you there. If you need to stick around for a while, there are special managers with special rules and totally different protocols who run the residence inns and the Fairfield suites. Um, this is what smart companies do today. They take big problems and they break them down into, into smaller, littler pieces where smaller organizations can take them on in specialized ways. And with this long tradition of localized, customized, personalized, you know, human scale solutions, philanthropy is now closely in step with this really exciting trend in American technology and American economy and American society. So please, 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 please stop apologizing for the, the small scale and the local fo focus of philanthropy. The rest of the world is heading in your direction, okay? This is, this is the future of, of human service. And a... Uh, a philanthropic sector that applies itself to energetically reforming America would do a lot more than just efficiently solve social problems. It would do that, all right? But it would do some, some other things I want to quickly touch on with you. How do I start? You know, 
allowing people allowing people to vote every couple of years on whether we will change a few members of the professional class of full-time politicians who rule over us. That's not American-style self-rule. You know, that, that really never was. Um, Thomas Jefferson called for a society where every person shares in the direction of the republic, participating in governance, not merely at elections, but each day. Right? This participatory democracy was very much what our founders had in mind. Or here's how another president put it. This is the issue. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. That was Ronald Reagan. I would like to ask you tonight to think of philanthropy in a little different way. I'd like to ask you to think of those millions and millions of individual givers, tens of millions of individual givers and volunteers in our country and the hundreds of thousands of nonprofits in our country, think of them as instruments of self-government, okay? Or, or maybe another way to put it is, think of them as a kind of a matrix of private legislatures. Because I think that's really what they are. All those charities, all those donors, all those volunteers do exactly what legislators do. They look around themselves, they look around the, where, the, wherever they are, and they say, hmm, here in Charleston, we, you know, we needed one of those parks that Carl was talking about, and we got a K-12 problem, and we also have this other issue over here. And then, after they've identified the problems, they, they set priorities and goals for attacking them, and then they marshal money and, and labor to, to, into solutions. And philanthropic Americans do that spontaneously. They don't ask for the state's permission. They just look around, and then they act. That's, again, just what any good legislator does. And when we take independent charitable action in the way I've just described to you, you become a producer of governance, all right? Instead of just being a consumer of government, you become a producer of governance. There is nothing illegitimate about that. There is, in fact, something very profoundly beautiful and deeply American about that. And we directly improve the life of people around us instead of being dependents who are going to you know, wait for officials to come and descend and save us. And there's one last, I think, really important reason why being a producer of governance, like all of you are and can be, uh, rather than just a consumer of government, is helpful to our country. You know, when you transfer responsibility for uh, strengthening our communities and away from this kind of direct democracy that I'm talking about of civil society and voluntary action and you instead move it toward bureaucratic agencies you don't just get clumsier and more impersonal services you get that but you get more than that when we do that we shrink the arena of American citizenship you just you, you kind of miniaturize the whole notion of what Americans are able to do for themselves. And that's a crucial reason, I think, why so many Americans have felt alienated from government and politics today. And to remedy that very, very serious problem, I would say that philanthropic action is a perfect antidote. Because when you devolve authority to groups of Americans so they can chip away at problems in their own backyards in ways that they think are best, um, that's going to do more than just make those communities function better. You know, for me at least, the, the deepest and the most understandable complaint of angry Americans today, and there are a lot of angry Americans today, and the thing that I would never ever discount in their anger is their feeling of powerlessness. That's where a lot of it comes from. They have this sense that their concerns and their perspectives are not represented in government. They never see their values enshrined in public policies. And they, they just don't feel like they're bought in. They don't feel like they're part of the process. What I'm calling on you to consider taking up tonight, as a philanthropic leader, is, is really dispersed governance, all right? It's dispersed governance through direct civic action. If you will lead, you can give everyday citizens a much stronger sense of having a voice and having a role in, um, in their own communities. You can help reduce this terrible feeling among Americans that they're being bossed or coerced by outsiders. That's poison, and, and that can be directly under, undercut and, and eaten away by by, by energetic local action. Localized um, micro-governance of the kind I'm describing, led by philanthropists, can help cure the popular unrest that we've seen in recent political seasons. I think it can really ratchet down a lot of the, 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 the more general frustration with the way we are governed. So let me close by reminding you that uh, you have real power 
in your hands. You know, you, I, it's, some, it's sometimes easy to forget that, but you, you, you really have power in your hands. You know, when I, re when I started this research, I will confess to you, I, I didn't really realize that a lot of what we think of today as quintessential, you know, wholesome middle American values, they were not the norm in this country for most of the 19th century when the great charitable reformers went to work. Um, but by the time those reformers were done with their charitable action, we had a country that was deeply impressive. Impressive, socially impressive, morally impressive, economically. And most of the necessary reform was not accomplished through, through government. It was not accomplished through politics. It was not accomplished through elections. It was accomplished through direct civic action, through volunteering and through private giving. So, you know, my message is have heart, really have heart. Um, we've recovered before from much deeper cultural and political problems, and we can recover again. And we don't have to depend upon always disappointing politicians. Because if, if, you put your, if you put your bow on that, on that, on that horse, you're going to be disappointed. The key is to play your part. I know it seems like this little drop in the bucket, what can I do here? If everybody plays their part and contributes directly to improving our nation in their backyard in muscular and inventive ways without asking permission, then really great things begin to happen. And if donors and volunteers will act, rather than, you know, again, waiting for this distant, divided, impersonal agency to solve our problems for us, very, very dramatic improvements are, uh, are possible in American life. It's happened in the past, and it can happen here starting tomorrow. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.